everyone. My name is Samia Hanka, and I am a first year PhD student at the University of California, Riverside, studying propaganda and media literacy um, in an effort to help raise awareness to the um, helping to raise awareness to the negative portrayals of Palestinians in the media. Um, that is why I am honored to introduce our keynote speaker tonight. I'm newly dipping my toes into academia, so I'm really blessed to be honoring someone who I really look up to in this field. Born and raised in Nevis, Palestine, Dr. Rabab Abdul Hadi is the founding director and senior scholar of the Arab and Muslim Ethnicities and Diaspora Studies program at the San Francisco State University, which is intended to become the fifth department in the College of Ethnic Studies. Before joining San Francisco State University, she served as the first director of the Center for Arab American Studies at the University of Michigan Dearborn. She's taught at eight universities, including Yale University and the American University in Cairo, where she was honored with Teaching Excellence Awards. Dr. Abdul Hadi is the recipient of a multitude of academic and, com and community awards, including the Sterling Fellowship, Evelyn Shakir National Arab American Book Award, Alex Oda Memorial Award, and current awards by Al Auda and American Muslims for Palestine. She was awarded the Georgina Smith Award by the American Association of University Professors for her scholarship and activism on behalf of women and labor rights and for building AMED studies. At SFSU, she developed AMED studies as an academic minor with 22 courses, including courses on Palestine, Islamophobia, civil liberties, and Arab revolutions. She is the faculty advisor to the General Union of Palestinian Students, the Muslim Student Association, and the Muslim Women's Studies Association. She co-created the Edward Said Scholarship and, it, oh, and sorry, established the collaborative MOU agreement with Al Najah University, which is the first and only agreement SFSU has with any site in Arab and Muslim communities worldwide. Now, without further ado, please join me in welcoming our keynote speaker, Dr. Rabab Abdul Hadi. Assalamu alaikum. Good evening. Buenas tardes. I first begin by recognizing that we convene on unceded indigenous lands of the people of these lands. This is something we always do. When people come to visit Palestine, we want people to understand that they are always on indigenous Palestinian land. Whether they're visiting, whether they're living, whether they're staying, it's Palestinian land and remains Palestinian land. I want to thank the Arab American uh, Civil uh, Union here for actually inviting me to keynote this very important event and also for opening this space for so many young people to speak and to share the stage here. Those of us who are the old timers, or as my students called us, called me the OGs, and I guess <laughs> what is OG in the whole world? But then I learned, I learned what that means. Actually are in awe of all the young people who are speaking, and I just want to mention the folks who are participating tonight, Reem, Edan, I, I see you and I hear your, sub, your subversion. I pay attention and I'm hearing you. It's really wonderful. Thank you. So you and your politics to raise consciousness. For art against apartheid. Yes. Mr. Lisa will be joining up with Muhammad al Kurd, a very talented poet whom I've actually had the, 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 the pleasure to meet back when he and another student from Students for Justice in Palestine actually picked me up at the National Students for Justice in Palestine conference at Houston, Texas. Yeah. And I said, who are you? And he said, I'm Muhammad al Kurd." And I said, do you know al Kurd family in Jerusalem? <laughs> and he said, yes. And I said, do you know Nabil? Do you know Nabil? And he said, she's my grandmother. Allah yirhamha. She 
She was an amazing. And tomorrow is Mother's Day in the US, and she was an example of the Palestinian women who stood up and resisted again and again and again until the day she passed. And she passed on her spirit, obviously, to her children and her grandchildren. And it's really amazing to actually see you here, Muhammad, and see all the work that you have been doing. And you're going to be speaking about that, and you're going to be honored. You should be honored every single day for what you are doing. I'm also so elated that Sarah Seth is here. Speaking about incarceration. Silenced. All of you are using culture, you're using your filmmaking to actually remind us of the voices of the culture from which we are coming, which makes us very proud. We're thinking and recalling Nuh Ibrahim, who wrote the song that people know, from the prison of Akka, there was a funeral, about the three Palestinians who were hanged by the British for resisting British colonialism. Hassan Kenafani, who needs no introduction. Fadwa Tukon, Um Kalthum, Marcel Khalifa, Umayma Al Khalil, Al Ashikin, Al Funun, and Sheikh Imam and Ahmed Fuad Nijan, who also come to us from Egypt. And we think, and I'm thinking about that, and I'm thinking about us, Hassan Kenafani, calling out in his book. Men in the sun, لماذا لا تقرع الجدران? Why aren't you knocking at the walls in order to be freed? And as if Tawfiq Zayyad responds and said, Anadikum, I call on you, I call on you from the land to come and remember and connect with each other. And here they engage with Ahmed Imam. Okay? Who actually don't want to say, Ya Palestinian will go to any ma'atu. But they also sing against the fat cats. They sing about the prisoners and think, sing about Nixon when he visited Egypt and opposing open door policy and the things that we are seeing today. It's, I'm really elated to have all these voices here and I think it's really important for us to recognize. And why am I saying this? Because I think the struggle that everybody's talking about here, whether we talk about the prisoners, and this is a very, very big. In Palestine, we say the prison is a university. And of course, nobody really wants to be, to join that university. People are forced to join it, but they subvert the place of incarceration to a place of resistance, just like what Ala is doing by writing the book, and just like the Palestinians and other prisoners, including Abdul Rahman, when you people may know or may not know, he is a Saudi writer who wrote Ashraf al Mutawasir and then he wrote the other book, Ashraf al Mutawasir, and Huna Ashraf al Mutawasir Marra Ukra, in order to talk about what happens to prisoners because it connects the struggles for civil rights, it connects the struggle for collective rights, it connects the struggle against colonialism, it connects the struggle for self determination, for dignity, for freedom for everybody. It's very, very important and it also reminds us as coming here to recognize Arab American culture, what is it that we want to recover and teach and research in Arab American studies? What does Arab American studies raise for us? Are we able to actually remember our organizations like the Arab American University graduates, AAUG, of the 60s? Some people may have actually belonged to, to that organization. Or the United Auto Workers, Arab United Auto Workers, who collaborated with black workers in Detroit, factories in order to demand divestment from Israeli bonds. Are we able to think about in the 1980, 1980s of uh, organization of Arab students who ended actually before that, General Union of Palestine Students, Palestine Solidarity Committee, Union of Palestinian Women's
that's another discussion. Or the November 29th coalition that was founded in 1981 to have one event, national demonstration, the first one in the United States, to commemorate the International Day of Solidarity with the Palestinian people. And then when the Israeli invasion of Lebanon took place in 1982, became a coalition that was led by Palestinians and Lebanese, and included every single movement in the world, over 100 organizations that came together. And I'll speak a little bit about that in a minute. And last but not least in this area, and this is not the only example, the Committee for Justice for the Los Angeles Eight, and that was in 1986 here, actually in Anaheim. And one of the most, I think the most important lessons maybe around the LA-8 case, is that this was, the LA-8 were arrested in order to set a chilling effect to the community and silence and challenge the ability to speak for justice in and for Palestine. And the United States government at that time, Reagan Bush era, thought that they would scare the community. Instead, the community from here, from Orange County, from this area, took three buses to the prisons where the LA8 were imprisoned and stood outside and said, we were not going to be afraid. We're going to fight for them and we're going to support them. And it's always a choice. It's always a choice to teach Palestine. It's always a choice take the cost of teaching Palestine. Any choices we make are, we might think they are optional, but it's not optional if we want to survive as a community, and if we want to fight racism, Islamophobia, and all the ills that befall us. I believe, uh, I forgot your first name. I Samia, Samia, I remembered your last name because you told me your grandfather was very much one of the people who actually wrote the history, worked on the history of Thomas Aya. Samia was, spoke about the Ahmed Studies Program, Arab and Muslim Ethnicity and Diaspora Studies Program, that I was recruited to San Francisco State to build. But I just want to highlight a couple of things. I don't need to say everything. That we emphasize the respect and legitimization of the lived experiences of communities. We place the communities and their voices at the center of analysis. And we believe in justice-centered knowledge production. We do not produce knowledge in order to teach students how to become good in Arabic in order to interrogate and torture other people. We do not teach students to go and break bombs. We do not teach students to go and kick off people of their land. We teach justice. And we insist that this is the center of what teaching Palestine means and it's all about. It's as a legitimate, necessary, and urgent part of the curriculum, not only outside of the curriculum, not something that we do in our extracurricular activities. This is something that's part and parcel. And when we teach Palestine, when we teach justice, as people here in California have been teaching about the history of the state, in ethnic studies and other places, where people learn about what is going on, they challenge the injustice of the world. And this is exactly why those of us who have been attacked within the academy and outside of the academy have been attacked. Because we are inspired, we are at San Francisco State University, the home of the Side 968 strike, the longest strike in the student history in the US, led by the Black Student Union and the Third World Liberation Front with support from the faculty, support from the union, support from the community, and also it coincided with many struggles in 68, whether in Paris, people know Paris, people know Berkeley, free speech movement, people know Columbia University, but people do not know that there was also a very strong struggle in Tunisia. There was a very strong struggle in Senegal, not only in Paris, but also there was a very strong struggle at the University of Mexico where the army actually invaded the university and killed on October 7 students. And we have just returned from the World Social Forum in Mexico City, a big part of which was the Palestine Social Forum. And we saw uh, what was going on. The 1968 demanded the decolonizing of the curriculum, demanding opening the university to the community, and demanding holding ourselves accountable to the community. And thus we started the Ahmed Studies program specifically along these principles. However, this is unacceptable to the people who would like to silence and censor. 
Pakistan. It is unacceptable to the Israeli lobby. And when I say the Israeli lobby, I'm not just talking about APAC. I'm talking about the groups that come together, well organized, well funded, collaborate with the right wing, collaborate with white supremacists in order for them to shut down what we are trying to do. And actually, in a way, they have succeeded to transform our campus, which has a social justice mission, and from a public university to a corporatized private university that is more accountable to Zionist groups and to big tech industries. This is what we call the new McCarthyism, that intends to smear, to intimidate, to isolate, to threaten by death, to use every single Islamophobic, Orientalist, Colonialist, racist, send emails, send death threats, file lawsuits. And some of you know about that. We don't have time to go into all of it now. But why is that? And I think it's very important to understand. Two reasons, at least. One, because Israel has failed. The Zionist project in Palestine has failed. It might look like it's succeeding every single day, but it has failed to erase Palestine from the map. It has failed to erase the Palestinian people from the map. It has failed to crush the work of the Palestinian. It also has failed in the United States to actually spread its lies and its narrative to let people think that actually what they are saying is true. And when they fail, the pro-Israel lobby tries to actually cover up for what Israel is doing here by bullying, by intimidating, by threatening, by smearing. And we all know that bullies become bullier whenever they are held accountable. They don't go away. And so, but on the other hand, we do have a very broad coalition. We have more and more people in this country, the United States with Israel and the Zionists believe that they own, we have more and more people supporting Palestine. We have more and more people understanding. And this has to do with the efforts of the Palestinian people, with the resistance of the Palestinians, with their insistence to stay on their land. And I'm staying away from citing Sheikh Jarrah because we have Sheikh Jarrah here. So it's the and they try to shut down everything that we're doing in a project that's called the Hasbara in order to try it from all Israeli sources. But just like the community in 1986 with the Los Angeles 8 case refused to be silenced and refused to go away and stood by the people in MA, so we do too. Along with people with multiple groups from the National Students for Justice in Palestine, Jewish Voice for Peace, the black community, Asian, Latinx community, our union, California Faculty Associate, from which my colleagues are here now, it has come up with more and more and more implications. In the San Francisco Labor Council that unanimously voted for a resolution for Palestine and against Zionism, 150 unions representing 100,000 workers. And recently we achieved three victories, unanimous victories by our colleagues that said that the university should apologize to us for silencing us. The university should allow us to be able to have our own classrooms. Nobody has the right to have any interference with the content of our curriculum. Palestine is a legitimate topic for understanding and learning. And the hostile work climate has to stop and we should be able to, to build the Ahmed Studies program as, 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 as we needed to. In the process, we also have had two major projects continuing. The delegations to Palestine, through which we take people, not in a solidarity like see and write and whatever, but in actually real reciprocal engagement with Palestinians from the indigenous and women of color feminist delegation to the first prisoner delegation to Palestine in which Mumia Abu Jamal, the most well-known prisoner in the U.S. called a collect from his prison to Birzeit University where we were meeting to wish Palestinian prisoners support and to support what they were doing. The people who have and stood by them. To Angela Davis, who went to Palestine and connected with the Palestinian prisoners, who sent her the letter, smuggled it across, across bridges and seas to her prison and held her steadfast. This is what we're talking about. We're talking about teaching Palestine. I want to just invite you, in conclusion, to join us 
in the Project Teaching Palestine 2022 is going to be commemorated the 40th anniversary of the Israeli invasion of Lebanon, the siege of the Beirut, and the Sabra and Shatila massacre, and the 20th anniversary of the Jenin massacre and the reinvasion of Palestinian areas, and compare it to the present. Hear the voices of the marginalized. Listen to people's stories. The Zionists are trying to stop us. They issue statements, they issued another one last week. They will continue doing it. They will continue trying to intimidate and smear. They will try, but we're here. We will not be silenced. We will not go away.